have his file, we emailed it to you, but something you are not going to read, believe it or not, he's got a Pentecostal background, is what I thought. And then, he also has an evangelical background, Chuck Smith, Calvary Chapel, and uh, now he's heading up ATS. So, very diverse uh, perspectives and spectrum in one person, and we are deeply honored to have you flying all the way from Pittsburgh. So, let's give him a big applause. As long as you don't make loud chewing noise, <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Is the microphone working okay? Okay. Even back here? Uh, if at some point, uh, uh, maybe I'll just take this out. Is that better? Uh, I, I should fill out a little bit of my bio uh, uh, that from for Young Lee. Is, uh, she rightly did put, I. Uh, my first experience in the church, I converted when I was 19. I lived here in Southern California, and I, I became a youth leader about three months after accepting Christ in um, Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, which was one of the original Jesus People mega churches. It's about 30,000 people. Um, it's where the surfers and the hippies would go to church when they weren't allowed to go to church. Um, but fairly conservative, I should say, very conservative, fundamentalist, um, charismatic megachurch. Um, I went, to, I quit pre-med and ended up going to uh, becoming a religion major at Southern California College, which is now Vanguard University, which is an Assembly of God um, liberal arts college. Um, and then, uh, against the recommendation of my Hebrew Bible professor, uh, went to Princeton Seminary where I became a, a very liberal Presbyterian. <laughs> Worked in the immigrant church for my field ed, um, uh, got ordained in the Presbyterian church, but stayed on at Princeton Seminary and did my PhD in Hebrew Bible, where I, uh, I uh, did work in feminist hermeneutics, um, cross-cultural hermeneutics, um, and then uh, eventually got, uh, after one teaching job at an Episcopal Seminary, taught at McCormick Theological Seminary for three years before I became its president in 2011. Um, and then was a president in McCormick until just a year, 18 months ago when I became the executive director of the Association of Theological Schools. Uh, ATS is the umbrella organization. It is a member school organization. It's an accrediting agency. We do all the accrediting for the 200, almost 270 schools in North America. Uh, it is a very broad and a theologically diverse members, set of member schools. Um, and in fact, it's one of the rare organizations where you actually get conservative evangelical Southern Baptists, uh, very liberal UCC and Unitarians, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, ELCA Lutherans, um, Roman Catholics, and Orthodox, who are all working towards the same goal, and that is to and that, whoa, okay, um, and that is to ensure quality in theological education, in graduate school, graduate theological education. Uh, I did want to extend my gratitude and thanks to Young Lee Herte for the invitation, um, and it's, it's good to be with Isaac. Um, I remember when Isaac was founded originally as the Institute for uh, the study of Asian American Christian uh, study of Asian American Christianity, um, and uh, uh, it was it was Tim Singh and a number of other um, uh, Asian American religion people who uh, scholars who were studying religion. We were all grad students at the time that um, eventually uh, met and used to meet in this conference called the Asian Pacific American Religion Research Initiative of PARI. Um, and so, Young Lee's right, we go way back, um, and Isaac goes way back, and I go way back with Isaac. I will say before I begin my comments as well, that it's um, both a little, uh, I, I, intimidating is not the right word, um, but as a, a good oldest 
uh, son of an Asian American family, Japanese American family, um, I feel a little awkward that my mentor is had 10 minutes on a panel, who's always brilliant, um, and she's the president of SBL, and then I, who have like one book compared to her four or five or six, um, get the, the main plenary on, of all topics, about women in the biblical witness. So you're hearing from a, a man, a feminist identified man, uh, but a male scholar. Um, and I, it, just, it just both, um, I wanted to express my gratitude to Gail. Uh, Gail is, uh, you all don't know what's such a treat um, to be able to listen to Gail, even if it was just for 10 minutes. Uh, she is the first Asian American president of the Society of Biblical Literature. <laughs> and the first woman in color. Right? Yeah. So, um, Gail's used to be a lot of firsts. As I, I know, actually, as I look around the room, I've heard some of your stories, as are many of you. So, um, on the topic of firsts, I, I did want to ask this question. I should get my PowerPoint out here. Where did you first see a woman preaching? Do you remember? Where you first saw a woman preaching? You don't, um, you don't have to uh, say it out loud, but just think about when that was. What were your thoughts and what were your feelings the first time you saw a woman preach? As, as I told you, I came from a tradition or I began my journey in the church in a tradition that did not allow women to preach. Um, and in fact, I remember my first Christian girlfriend. I remember having this conversation. She was a very seasoned leader in the youth group where we were both leaders. Um, and she would often say in frustration, she said, I could teach circles around these guys. <laughs> and yet she was still constrained within a theological system that wouldn't allow her or recognize her, not only to not be a teacher, but to not be a pastor, eventually. Um, and she would have been a great pastor. So you're thinking about the first woman preaching. Now I want you to ask, um, how many of you have actually been in congregations where there has been a woman on the pastoral staff? Now I want to see hands. Good, okay. Uh, that, that looks like a, a majority of the room. That's good, that's good news. Um, how many of you uh, have been in where there was um, more than, oh, where there was more than one woman on the pastoral staff? Okay, now quite a bit fewer, only about a third. Um, how many of you belonged to a church or attended a church where a woman was the lead pastor? Again, about a third. So I want you to see something. So this is the 21st century. Uh, and while, um, right, big news, Captain Obvious. Many of us have seen women preach. And I'm, I'm guessing what, you know, maybe some of you, throw out one word that, that, that described your feelings or your, uh, what you were thinking when you saw women preach. Just go ahead and kind of popcorn some few words out there. Was, what did you hear? What Fire. did you hear? Huh? Fire. Fire. <laughs> Others? Prophetic. Prophetic. What was the other one? Natural. Natural. Passion. Passion. Integrated. Integrated. Inspiring. Inspiring. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first started attending church with a uh, Presbyterian church with my family, I was so thrilled that my boys were going to church where they said every, every Sunday morning they would see a woman in the pulpit. And I thought that that had to send them a message about who could be in leadership. Um, I, was, I just spent a, 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 a few days recently um, at, um, in Atlanta for a gathering of ATS um, African-American presidents and deans. Um, 
And uh, we had a worship service. We attended a worship service at the Interdenominational Theological Center. Um, and I just heard one of the most dynamic, it's probably the best sermon I've heard in the last three years, um, from Michelle Gidry. She's a, she's a product of theological education. I think she got her PhD at, um, uh, at, at uh, Garrett Evangelical Seminary. Um, Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary. And she is now, I think, the dean at Spelman. And she was preaching there on Founders Day and just did a dynamic job. And I kept on thinking, because she, she brought some of her students, undergrads, from Spelman, I kept on thinking, you know, what a witness to these young women who are perhaps aspiring to one day be pastors themselves, to see um, older, younger, uh, black men and women um, just shouting. And, you know, you've been in the black church before. Right? right, just shouting and celebrating and saying hallelujahs um, to this woman who was just inspired in preaching. But that pairs with the reality. Um, and actually, I was hearing one of her scholar mentors, who was who is now a president at a, at a theological school in Chicago, uh, and this this person said, "I had never heard her preach like that." And there, he said, there's something about being in an environment where you feel empowered. And I thought, I would wish that for just about any who are, feel called, and especially women who are in traditions where they maybe don't sense that, that sense of support and can never really preach their best selves. So I, I break into this as an, an anecdote because I want you to remember also the only about a third of you who raised your hands when you said that there was a lead pastor um, of, who was uh, a woman in the church. Because it speaks about uh, a broader culture um, shift, a cultural shift that needs to take place, right? So it's one thing for me to stand up here and say, I will give you some resources that are in the Bible. I will hopefully give you also some resources about interpretive practices and hermeneutics that can benefit you in your journey, but without a shift in the culture, you saw only a third of us raise our hands, it's like you're preaching upstream. So that's one of the things that I'm really glad about this movement and what you're, what you're trying to do here, Young Lee and Isaac, is it's not just about providing some resources, and, and, but there's a, a attractive mentoring that you're looking to build coalitions with other people, to share stories so that you're not by yourself. This is all part of a deeper work that hopefully begins to shift the culture, at least in certain places. Amen. So I titled my talk, The Sword That Cuts Many Ways. Now I know that's a, 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 a weapon imagery, and that's, I, I bring it up intentionally, because the Bible has sometimes been used as a weapon. A weapon against women, a weapon against people of color. But I, the subtitle is, the Bible is a source for women's leadership. So I wanted there to be that contradiction. Um, my sense, though, is that the Bible does cut many ways. The Bible as a resource, first of all, for women's leadership. So the Bible has served as both an instrument of liberation and as a tool for oppression. That is that the Bible, though many of our traditions you know, have some sense of what biblical authority means, the Bible, at least in its interpretation and the way that it's been used and exercised within communities of faith, is ambivalent. It has both been a source of inspiration and it has been a weapon used against people and marginalized bodies. The Bible has provided inspiration and served as a source for women and communities of faith to embrace a more equal pulpit, to value the lives of women and promote their leadership. And the Bible has also served as a proof text or a gatekeeper to bar women from leadership. So how many times has 1 Timothy, and again, we are, for those of you who, are, who have attended seminary, we all know that the, the, the pastoral epistles are not genuine calling. Um, maybe there are some who would argue that Timothy is, 
Um, but it also was written at a much later time in the church's history. But it's first Timothy it says, I permit no women to teach, to have authority over a man. And how much that this one text, out of all the biblical witness, right? This is kind of what proof texts do, that people single out one text and suddenly it becomes the central point of the canon. This has happened as well in LGBTQ communities. So, who has ever cared about the book of Leviticus? <laughs> right? Until the church begins to have arguments about, um, about sexuality. Now all of a sudden Leviticus is a central text. <laughs> and worse, the Bible has often reinforced scripts of violence on women's bodies. Uh, my dissertation uh, that I wrote at Princeton Seminary was on the rape narratives um, um, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible. Now, in order to understand women in the biblical tradition, we must first look at the culture of the Bible. And the, um, at the culture of the Bible and a biblical interpretation to understand this double-edged nature of the biblical texts. So first of all, when we see the Bible, right, everyone's the Word of God. One thing we should see is that the, the Bible is a very complex text. Um, you know, I was mentioning how it, it's funny, whenever the church gets into conflicts, all of a sudden text becomes central, right? It's like the canon shifts. Um, and, uh, but one thing that, we, that I hope you all have learned in your seminary is the Bible is a very richly diverse text. In some ways, it, it, it resembles, uh, if, if, there were, uh, if this was a period of biblical writing, um, and we had ATS schools writing for the Bible, what you would find is that there were all these texts that maybe had a center of gravity, maybe had some certain beliefs that they all shared about Jesus and about God and about the prophets, um, and then there would be a lot of things that differed from each other. This is the biblical witness, and this is the beauty of the biblical witness, that it was written over such long periods of time that what you see is both the evolution of a community and what they believe and what they hear about the witness to God, but you also see a diversity of perspectives, sometimes within the same period. So we must look at this complicated text from many different angles, and so I'm going to use a vast oversimplification. But think of the Bible in three realms, and in some ways this is more of a heuristic to help us examine the different ways um, that one can uh, approach the scripture and, um, and therefore think about different resources that the scripture brings. So first you have uh, the world that the text assumes, or you might call the world behind the text, right? This is the culture, the background uh, in which the Bible emerges. So, in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, this is the world of ancient Israel, right? Um, and, uh, and then you have, of course, the backgrounds um, uh, in the Hellenistic culture and the Roman culture, but also in the first century where you begin to see the Christian literature come to, come to the fore. And again, the Christian literature is really uh, a different, it's a messianic form of Judaism. Uh, it, it seems to emphasize a lot of teaching um, and as, as does um, a certain part of Judaism at the time, Pharisee, the Pharisees were which the Pharisees represented. You see this shift in the first century to a more teaching form of Judaism. And that's largely in response to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Okay? So these are the backgrounds. These are the kind of cultures, the worlds that lie behind the text, right? Many, many empires, many centuries of history. So to say that there's actually one world is, a, a, again, a vast overstatement. But this is the world that the text assumes. Then you have the world of the text itself. Okay? The written records, the, the records that we have that are collected, sometimes in fragments, sometimes in, 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 uh, uh, in other ways. But basically, these are the texts themselves, all right? Um, and then you have the world of the reader, the world in front of the text. Okay? Again, a vast oversimplification, but you can see that um, all of these things kind of matter when you're trying to find meaning. If you have a Venn diagram here, you see this little area right here? Um, 
this is maybe where meaning happens, but you can see different ways of overlap, uh, where you can see overlap in many of the different realms. So for example, you sometimes will have overlap between the world of the reader and the world behind the text. There are people, current interp biblical interpreters, who like to study the backgrounds and rethink and reconstruct the backgrounds behind the biblical texts. What was it like um, for the Israelites in the Babylonian exile? Um, what were the realities and the history during the Assyrian Empire during the monarchy? These are things that folks will reconstruct, modern interpreters will reconstruct from the world of the reader and pre present back onto the world behind the text or the world that the text assumes. Now, in our earlier panel, you heard this idea that no translation is um, obvious or that it's, it's always interpretation. All reconstructions of history and the backgrounds that undergird the text are also constructions within a reader's mind, right? So they take a look at the evidence, but you ask any one particular archeologist, they will look at the evidence slightly differently. So the reader can often bring their perspective into the world behind the text. Similarly, uh, the reader will often read the text itself differently. So for the many of you, you might remember, uh, maybe you remember historical criticism, that's what I was describing, um, where you have people trying to reconstruct the histories of ancient Israel. You also may have learned about literary criticism or narrative criticism. People are just reading the text as, as a narrative, as a story, um, the text itself, to see what meanings can be unpacked from the words that are in the text themselves. Again though, the world of the reader, or the reader is going to influence that world. So again, you can see how these things overlap, but I want you to use just this heuristic as a way then to think about the different resources that one can have when it comes to the Bible and when we look for um, resources for women's leadership. Um, so before we get into that, uh, we must say this. There are forces in each of these, each of these realms, that also seek to hinder, inhibit, um, block women's leadership. Uh, and let me give you some examples. So, just as an acknowledgement, um, as well as we all know, the world of the Hebrew, of the of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, the world of the Bible really presumes, uh, I think it was Uni who mentioned it, it's, it's a patriarchal culture, right? So these are, this is nothing new to us, but within the world behind or seen by a text, scholars have identified this in many different forms. Um, in my studies, uh, one of the things that was popular was they were drawing from anthropological studies. They looked at honor-shame cultures in the Mediterranean. Um, and this is a way to unpack the quote-unquote patriarchal culture. Again, patriarchal means just androcentric or male-dominated, but this will flesh it out a little bit. So in an honor-shaped society, um, honor is kind of the male realm, shame is the female realm. Now it doesn't have the uh, necessarily the same kind of positive and negative connotations that we have with honor and shame, uh, but honor is kind of an outward-facing kind of disposition. Uh, just think of, you know, I, I, I always thought of it in my mind, you got these men who are kind of have their chest out and they're looking at other men and they're, they're having these contests out in the public to see which group has the most honor, right? Um, but the realm of the honor is the outward facing is, is where one group can have honor for itself. The shame or the internal facing is where the realm of women lies. This is how they would depict the ancient world. So um, another way to think of that is, um, you know, shame can be a positive thing. You've heard, have you no shame, right? The idea is, have you no, um, you know, uh, manners or decency, right? The woman's realm was to preserve the internal integrity of the community, okay? So that's a description of it. Um, and this writes the cultural script for gender roles within the biblical. Now, men engage in the public and the women in the private sphere. Another feature of honor-shame culture is that it's dyadic, or it's group-centered, all right? So rather than individually focused. 
So let me show you how this plays out in the rape texts. So in Genesis 34, Dinah goes out to visit the women of the region, right? Do you, you, you all remember Genesis 34? It's not the text that comes up in Sunday school very often, right? <laughs> but because um, there's a whole bunch of horrible things that happen. So all honesty, um, I, I've actually sat through some pretty bad sermons um, before. And um, when my kids would get bored in the middle of those bad sermons, I would send them these weird texts. And I'd just have them read them, you know, because you, you, know, you never read these texts in Sunday school. Um, and I would, I would have them read Genesis 34, and they would give me these looks like a horror, like, what is this? Um, or, you know, in, JL, uh, in Judges chapter 4, where JL, you know, drives it, drives a peg through Cicero's forehead, and, you know, and I can remember my kids, like, reading this, and they just go, <laughs> and, you know, and it, it helped make church not so boring, <laughs> but uh, Genesis 34 is one of those texts. This is a text of terror, for sure. Dinah goes out to visit the woman of the region. So remember, we're thinking honor shame. So by saying that, she is a woman going out into the male realm to engage others. It's a place of danger. She goes out into the male realm and she's raped by Shechem, a Hivite. And what then happens is that they don't go to court, right? There becomes this negotiation among the men about, well, are we going to intermarry? They say, sure, I guess so. They, they kind of shake hands on that. And then at night, you remember what happens? Uh, they, the, the Hivites, they go, all go and they say, well, great, we're going to intermarry with, with this Jacobite clan. And, uh, and they all get circumcised. And it says, the Bible says, while they're still in pain, uh, the brothers, the brothers of Israel, basically come together and they slaughter the entire city. So, but notice how again within the honor shame, you see what's happening. Instead of seeing this as just an individual act of aggression against one woman, the group perceives it as a threat to their own honor and the group of men. And so, what becomes the rape of one woman becomes, in essence. Um, the war between two men, two groups of men. So this is how the honor-shame dynamic plays out. Now, all of that, again, is another way to kind of deepen this world of quote-unquote patriarchy. Um, this is not just a male-centric world. It is a male-dominant world. It is a world in which the male point of view is not just privileged, but is considered to be the normative point of view. So, um, this is the world behind the text. See how patriarchy infects this? So, um, why do we even deal with these texts then? Are these texts so infected with patriarchy that they can have no meaning? Well, that would, then we have to remember the fact that these texts have also been points of liberation for them. So how is this? Well, we get, we'll get to the realm of interpretation in just a second. But within the world of the text, so we're in this, the top bubble here. Because the world of the Bible is also androcentric, and because the world of the Bible is androcentric and male-dominated, the text that this culture produced will contain language, tropes, and metaphors that reflect that culture. It remains in the text themselves. So here's an example, and Gail has written extensively on this. Um, if you haven't read her book, Poor Banished Daughters of Eve. Um, and children. children of Eve, thank you. Um, it's, it's a great book, and she actually does a great unpacking of this whole notion of woman is evil. But she um, also covers these tropes in Ezekiel and Jeremiah where you're dealing with the unfaithful wife. Where Israel is the unfaithful wife. In the prophets, we see this in Ezekiel, we see this in Jeremiah, we see it in Hosea with Gomer. It is clear, but think about this, it's clear that both men and women can be unfaithful in the biblical world. Right? You even know in the biblical text himself, King David commits adultery. But in a patriarchal world, and in the text and the inscriptions of the text, Israel is denoted as an unfaithful wife. It is the infidelity of the wife that gets projected onto the entire people as a symbol of unfaithful. 
So this both reinforces the negative gender script through the male lens and leaves textual vocabulary in the text itself that later interpreters use, which reinforces the patriarchy within contemporary communities. So, patriarchy infects the world behind the text. It is the world behind the text. It infects the text themselves, and it infects the world of the reader, right? So patriarchy can be seen, be seen in the ways that the readers deploy their own theologies about gender when, the, when they read the texts. Examples. Um, so historical critical examinations of the world in which the Bible is written are not disinterested accounts of what actually happened, but reflect the assumptions of these interpreters of Israel's past and the early histories of the first Christians. And this is something we know, and, and it's not hard to find out. Uh, there was a period of time um, that, that actually really informed a, a, an interpretive method within biblical criticism called ideological criticism. It had its roots in a lot of Marxist theory. Um, Marxism was really, really popular in the 60s and 70s in the universities. And um, so it's funny then if you actually, I remember when I studied for my comprehensive exams and, and my doctoral exams, uh, reading some of the histories that were created from scholars like Gottwald and those who's, who's, who were the, kind of the, the creators of ideological criticism. And it was amazing how much the, the proletariat struggle got, in, got inscribed on the history of ancient Israel. See? So, in other words, these histories are interested texts. So history is not only told by the winners, but by those who seek to maintain the privilege of the systems to support their own power. So it might, it's possible when looking at the daunting array of how patriarchy so infects every level of biblical interpretation, so that you would want to even throw the towel or disregard the biblical text as a resource for women's leadership. And some interpreters have chosen this route. However, one must also remember that cultures, texts, and interpretations are polysemic. That is, they are made up of signs or webs of signification that have potential to generate multiple meanings. So they have seams, they have slippages. Um, Ecclesiastes talks about what is left over or yet thrown. What, one, what is the profit of one's work? And through all of the work and desire to acquire wisdom, Kohelet describes it as a chasing after the wind. So uh, it's like grasping at wind. Think about it, just, it just slips through your fingers. So while culture, texts, and interpretations try to nail down meaning into something that is stable and fixed, there is always slippage, there are always cracks and seams through which other interpretations can emerge. Readings of the Bible that can subvert the very cultures that the Bible assumes. So, so before we move into discussion about hermeneutics as a resource, there's a potential project that I think um, maybe some of you might be interested. I hope you would take it on or a group of colleagues could pursue. Gather a list of some of these biblical texts. Because I think if, if, if what I'm causing here, that interpretation matters, and that interpretation is going to be based on your own sets of belief and the cultures that you bring to the text, um, then where better to find resources from the Bible than in your own interpretations of some texts? See what you see in these texts. Use your, the, your training in seminary and in commentaries and in other biblical scholarship to begin to unpack the text in different ways. Um, and I want to encourage you to do that with rigor and with courage um, and with not as much attention to what, uh, if, if, you think, if you find you come out with an interpretation that seems a little out of balance or not so much um, consistent with what you see in everything else uh, in other biblical scholarship. My, this is how communities of interpretation begin. Okay. So, um, what I would want to encourage you to do in this project is gather a list of these biblical texts that would be good for theological reflection on women and women's leadership.
So these could include depictions of women's leadership. So for example, taking characters like Hagar, uh, a woman who's um, dislocated not just because, again, the irony that she is an Egyptian slave woman, right? Think about how ironic that would be in an Israelite mindset, right? She's an Egyptian slave woman, a servant. And um, so she's marginalized by her ethnicity. She's marginalized by her class, right? And yet, we'll, uh, we'll look at her text in just, uh, these texts in just a minute, and yet, she is given similar promises to the ancestors of Israel. Or Sarah and the ancestress of Israel, or the Hebrew midwives of Exodus 1, or Miriam, or Deborah in the book of Judges, and Jael, by the way. Well, I think Jael is just, well, I've got a word in my head, but I'm going to filter it. Um, <laughs> she, is, she is just bad. You know what I mean? Yeah, thank you. I always thought that it would be great for a feminist punk band to name themselves Jail's Peg. You know, just, um, and, and then uh, and the Book of Ruth and all its complexities and all its complicities, and yet and all of its um, uh, the ways in which Ruth, um, a Moabite woman becomes the paradigmatic, paradigmatic example of Jewish piety. Yeah. Esther, who is called to be a queen at such a time as this, Mary, in her singing of the Magnificat. Take these texts, find these texts, list these texts, maybe even create a lectionary of these texts to work with the congregation through them in a year-round basis. Also, do critical assessments of texts that have historically harmed women. The Garden of Eden story. Boy, you could do a, like a history of interpretation of the Bible and the different methods that people use in the Bible by just looking at Genesis 1 through 3, or Genesis 2 through 3. As I mentioned, I, you know, I've done my study on the rape texts, but also, some of these texts where even women are, are uh, depicted as evil, or where women are seen as unfaithful. Read them with a critical lens and try to read against them. I think you will find that there are different ways to read those texts than just to say that they are just, they are certainly texts of terror, but you will find that within them, there's some cases an unraveling of the terror that suggests that the culture is indeed complicit. Um, again, let me give you an example. So one of my theses within the, in my study of the rape texts, um, the three stories that I, I, I looked at were Genesis 34, the rape of Dinah, Judges 19, the rape of an unnamed concubine, and 2 Samuel 13, the rape of Tamar, half-sister, uh, or, uh, 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 yeah, half-sister of um, Absalom. So, uh, in each of these cases, the initial rape turns into violence among men, and then to a larger disintegration of some kind of social unwinding within very key significant Israelite institutions. Think about that. Genesis 34 is the paradigmatic Israelite family, right? The, 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 the Jacob and, his, and, and the 12 sons. Uh, the Judges 19 is the is the tribal confederation. Second Samuel 13, the Davidic monarchy. And in each of these cases, when justice is not properly given to the woman, and in each of these cases, the woman is left desolate. When proper justice is not paid attention to by these clans of men, social disintegration begins to happen. And it is an inner critique of the very culture that it's assumed. It's almost as if the Bible is trying to work out what went wrong. Why does this keep on going wrong in the same kinds of ways in, in the heart of Israel's institutions? So learn how to read critically the texts. 
terror or the text that have brought women's harm. Um, identify biblical themes that are countercultural to the norms within the biblical world. So God's option for and liberation of the poor, God's care for the widow and the orphan, etc. So look for these more broader, these broader liberative themes that can begin to look at these um, cultures of hierarchy and of patriarchy and call them into question. So, let's, let's turn the corner. I'm looking at my time here. I'm still doing, oh, I've got to wind this up pretty quickly. Okay, so um, let's, let's get to some broader notions of biblical interpretation. So, we're looking at the Bible itself, resources within the Bible itself. Um, and I was pointing out the difficulty of finding these resources, but also the liberative power that lay within the texts. And I think the liberative power needs to be unpacked by communities of interpretation. Okay? So as we turn towards communities of interpretation, that's um, one of the ways that we can look at that. And a good resource for unpacking um, interpretive methods is by looking at hermeneutics, or that is the study of the methodologies behind the Bible. How one reads. Um, there is such a wealth of resources. We live in a, a, a time, even if we are living in a time when only a third of us can raise our hand and say we have memories of being in a church where there is a lead pastor who is a woman. Uh, we also are now decades into um, just some very robust and profound feminist uh, examination of, of biblical scholarship or biblical literature. So there's a long history of biblical interpretation by women and the difference women readers had on interpretation of the Bible. Um, I don't need to go into the long history of that. You can find in almost every introduction of a feminist text on the Bible. We'll go through some of the history. But they would include the likes of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who really began to, uh, who gathered a group of intellectual women to study women in the Bible, um, or Sojourner Truth, um, both, uh, both of whom, by the way, were suffragettes and abolitionists. Um, so, um, but I could also point you to the many resources on the history of feminist scholarship in general and women's interpretations of the Bible in specific. But, so this is again, a, a vast oversimplification. If you thought my little three kind of realm scene was a simplification, oversimplification, this is covering decades of scholarship in about five minutes. But, um, you remember those three realms? We find this also, that the feminist scholarship is not limited to one realm. So what we find is there are biblical scholars who've been investigating the world behind the Bible. So I would put in that camp. Well, uh, uh, in memory of her, Elizabeth Schistler Fiorenzo, uh, where she argues and tries to, she reconstructs a more egalitarian Christian community that, of course, included the leadership of women. And uh, this, so she's really trying to reconstruct Christian origins. Um, uh, also, Carol Myers um, and her book, Discovering Eve, it's not just an examination of Genesis, of Genesis 2 through 3 and following. But it is an archaeological exploration of, of how she reads the data as a feminist biblical scholar. Um, and what she finds is that, um, boy, women had it rough, but they also had a lot of both um, uh, formal and informal power within the ancient world that the biblical texts never seemed to convey. Why is that? Well, because the biblical texts was, were written by male elites. Okay? But what she suggests is that women indeed were not just the uh, the ones who held the community together, the community glue, so to speak. But they were, they were also um, very active in the production of, of agriculture uh, within ancient Israel. So, again, a reconstruction that then she begins to unpack the texts in light of. Uh, and then you get biblical scholars, feminist scholars, who are really looking at the text itself. And I think there are very, uh, in my mind, fewer, more brilliant um, unpackers of word by word, line by line, examinations of, of certain texts, especially texts of terror, than Phil's trip. 
she is both just a masterful reader, and in some ways she comes from the Baptist tradition, so for those of you who've heard a Baptist sermon, it's like kind of that word by word, line by line kind of, but uh, Baptist close reading. Well, she takes that to a scholarly level, and, and she's also a masterful writer, um, and just wonderfully crafts these things. Um, but she unpacks these texts of terror, um, these texts that have created terror for women. It includes, uh, of course, some of the rape texts. It includes the text of Hera and uh, of Hagar. Um, it includes uh, many other texts that, uh, that have violence against women. Um, this is an important text as well. Just a sister way, Renita Weems, and women's, womanist biblical scholars, at this, around the same time that womanist um, theologians are, are really leveling a significant critique to white feminism, uh, feminist theology, by saying, well, you know, you white feminists are doing a good job of trying to unpack the patriarchal nature of the theological task and the patriarchal nature of God. Um, and they're, you're doing a wonderful job of critiquing that, but you're missing something when you say the experience of women. Because they're saying, you're speaking for all women, and you're not all women. And particularly, they name the issues of race and class. So for a womanist, they find themselves in a, uh, basically like in a triple dilemma. They are not only marginalized by the patriarchy that white women are trying to critique, but they are also marginalized by racism and classism. This gives rise as well to a host of other interpreters from the global context, so post-colonial readings um, that are really leveling the critique to a broader colonialist critique of Western thought. Um, the Woman's Bible Commentary, which was a, a richly collaborative group of feminist biblical scholars, they do a commentary on the entire Bible. Um, there's Gail's great text, Poor Banished Children of Eve, um, where Gail, again, Gail uh, is one of those who also uses kind of some of the historical critical or the ideological critical methods, but she also reads a lot, does a lot of narrative and literary unpacking. And even does, if I remember right, some kind of psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis um, uh, when, when you're reading the text in Ezekiel, I seem to remember. The, the idea of, of, um, of trauma, that trauma studies, thank you. Um, this is around the same time as well, we begin to see some women, women, uh, women of color beginning to unpack the Bible from a theological perspective. So we have Kwakwe Lans, Discovering the Bible in a Non-Biblical World. We also get um, uh, Ana Maria Isasi Diaz La Luke, and La Lucha in the struggle, uh, where she's really exploring the biblical text um, to argue for a Mujerista theology. Um, and I think I always, again, I, the list could go on and on, but now we have second generation of womanists, womanist scholars who have just put out a book, Womanist Interpretation of the Bible, expand, Expanding the Discourse. If I were to compile a bibliography today of feminist, womanist, and um, scholarship by women of color, I think you could probably fill it in an entire book. The resources are out there, so another task for you might be this. Um, you know, maybe spend um, some time, collaborate with some of your friends, use some of your old library passes that you can still use. A lot of them, they, your schools will let you as an alumna or an alumnus use the library and start creating lists for each other of resources from um, these, this resource of womanist and feminist scholars who are reading the Bible in very different ways than from what you might have seen in your syllabus in Bible 101. <laughs> so, let me unpack this with a final example here. I'll only go about another five minutes. Um, just, just to give you an example again of why reading and from where you read and why it matters. And that's again what, if you can hear this as an encouragement, it's why it's so important for you to gather these resources 
find out what resources are there for you, and begin to create your own communities of, of both scholarship and of interpretation. Because um, the place from where you come is going to be different than maybe the place that, that your denomination is coming from. The place from where you read is going to be different than maybe your sister across from you. But you can learn from those differences. Um, so uh, these are going to be some readings from Genesis 16 and 21. This is the story of, again, Hagar, Sarah, and Abraham. Um, in 16, uh, you know, we have Abram and uh, Sarah still, right? So, um, you know, uh, again, you probably learned this in your biblical studies classes. Uh, Genesis 16 is a Yahweh's narrative. Uh, Genesis 21 is an Elohist narrative. And you see the differences and, um, and the different theologies that were, um, that the Yahweh's and Elohist developed. That's kind of how I learned these texts. But these texts just explode when you look at them from different perspectives, and in particular, from the ways that women read. So, um, here's, here's a list of some interpreters we'll look at, just as a sample. Gerhard von Rod, 20th century, mid 20th century German scholar, he was also a Lutheran, Lutheran pastor. You probably have read von Rod at some point. Um, I, I actually remember reading his commentary on Genesis and his Old Testament theology, and it just made me weep. There was some, some, some beautiful theology in it. Um, so that's why it's, it uh, stood some of the test of time. He was, he was a brilliant theologian and a biblical scholar. Phyllis Tribble, late 20th century, first generation literary feminist biblical critic. And then I've also included a theologian here, um, Dolores Williams, a late 20th century womanist theologian, who wrote a book, a brilliant uh, book, theology called uh, Sisters in the Wilderness. So, um, first of all, Von Rod. Here's just kind of a summary of this interpretation. These are a few quotes from Von Rod. A faint-hearted faith, he's talking about this story of Hagar and Sarai, Sarai and, um, and Abram, and the fact that, you know, they try and use Hagar as a surrogate to give birth to the child of promise because they can't because Sarah is still barren. So this is how uh, Von Rad interprets this. It's a faint heart of faith that cannot leave things with God and believes it necessary to help things along. Okay? Sounds like a good Lutheran piety, right? <laughs> um, and so conceived in defiance or in little faith cannot be the heir of promise. Again, again, I mean, this is, this is kind of like classic Lutheran theology, right? But then, notice Phyllis Tribble. And again, this is where Phyllis Tribble's literary genius really comes out. And she's talking about Hagar. Notice where she shifts the focus. We move from the family of promise to Hagar, um, the isolated woman. Yet she experiences exodus without liberation, Revelation without salvation. She sees God, remember? Wilderness without covenant. Remember the second story in particular? She's left in the wilderness, and she, like the Israelites, eventually finds water. But wilderness without covenant. Wanderings without land. She wanders in the wilderness. Promise without fulfillment. Read closely the promises that are given to Hagar. They are almost identical to the promises given to Abraham. Think about theologically what that says. That we've heard that theme um, in some of the early panels, that God is making a covenant with those who are on the outside, with those who are marginalized. And here God is, in the, and again, with the very first family, making a covenant with Hagar, the Egyptian slave woman. So, wanderings without land, promise without fulfillment, and an unmerited exile without return. Again, isn't that brilliance? But notice one of the things that Phyllis Tribble kind of masks or hides. She's a white feminist interpreter, 
And she's not reading this as much, she does identify the, the ethnic difference that Hagar is an Egyptian, but she doesn't, she's kind of grouping it under woman's experience here though, an isolated, marginalized woman because of her ethnicity. Well then, Dolores Williams takes this and, and explores this boundary or this scene even more. The story of the Egyptian slave and her Hebrew mistress is hauntingly reminiscent of the disturbing accounts of black slave women white mistresses during slavery. Wow. Wow. You see? The difference is that interpretation and what social location makes and what one can see in the text. So, um, I'll, I'll, I'll flip through these. And if you want, I can send these slides to um, Young Lee. She can give you this. But this is basically just a list of different approaches or ways of exploring that Alice Hawk and Bellis outlines in her book, Help Makes Harlots and Heroes. Um, there are many different ways to approach this. Um, but let me close with just this thought. In the spirit of Micah 4.3, it says, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. I wonder if in the resources that we find for women's leadership and empowerment within the Bible, and through the resources that we find through the interpretations of the Bible, we can extend this metaphor to transforming swords into sides, sides, you know, so we can harvest which can both clear new ways through the biblical texts, ways that empower women to lead lives that God has called them to live, and at the same time produce a harvest that sustains many others throughout the, through the nourishment that comes from the Word of God. I think the resources are not just in the text, but the resources are in this room. The resources for unpacking and clearing ways that maybe others haven't seen before. So friends, um, let us think of this as part of our ongoing work. Not just to read the Bible, and not just to read it differently, but to be committed to the justice, um, and the equality, and the spirit of liberation that has fallen on prophets of old, and sometimes even on those outsider Gentiles to produce communities of faith that surprises the status quo of our faith and in fact calls them to conversion to the mission that God has put before them. Thank you. Well, it was so rich.